One of the states really leading the charge in the fight for freedom and liberty is the live free or die state in New Hampshire. I've got to say, as a Mainer, sometimes I get a little jealous of all the liberty that's happening right across the border in New Hampshire. Uh, but so many great things happening since uh, the uh, liberty movement there has become incredibly powerful, has elected people to the state uh, legislature. Now, Liberty Republicans are the majority of the majority in the state legislature, and they're getting all kinds of great things done, from slashing state spending to passing uh, educational savings accounts for real school choice. So many great things happen in New Hampshire. And today, I have a friend who's with a movement in New Hampshire called the Free State Project, bringing in people from across the country who believe in that mission statement live free or die, to come, relocate, move to New Hampshire, and make New Hampshire the free state it has always declared itself to be. We're going to be talking about some of the accomplishments for liberty in New Hampshire over the course of the last year, and what may be some opportunities on the horizon in the year ahead. Her name is Carla Garrick. Hey, Carla, welcome Hi, back Eric. to Free America Thanks now. for having me. Thanks so much <laughs> hey. for having me. <laughs> Well, the pleasure's all mine. I think in the past I have called you the, the, the most interesting woman in the world. And I, I, I mean that in all seriousness, because when I read your biography, your background and everything you've accomplished in your life, uh, you've led a very interesting life already. And now you are working with the free state movement to, to, challenge, to challenge government tyranny on the state and the federal level. Uh, so glad to have you back. I guess, uh, you know, some may have heard your past episode on the Free America Now audio podcast, and I know we went in depth a little bit on your background and some of that, but could you just tell folks who may be watching uh, a little bit about yourself and how you got in this fight for liberty? Sure. So um, I'm originally from South Africa, and I grew up in a diplomatic household, so I sort of traveled and lived all over the world. Um, and then while I was in law school in South Africa, my parents had entered me into the green card lottery, and I won a green card to come to America. And of course, I was like, yes, please. That sounds like an awesome opportunity. And uh, finished my law degree in South Africa and then got married and moved to America. We ended up in Silicon Valley where I work for Fortune 500 tech companies as a lawyer. I started out as a paralegal. I had the very typical immigrant story, came with two suitcases, I had $7,000, lived in the Tenderloin in San Francisco in a one bedroom, well, not even a one bedroom, a studio apartment with a bath in the kitchen, uh, you know, junkies, a crack house. I mean, it was the whole thing. Worked my way up slowly but surely, retook the bar, got some great jobs, did the dot-com bubble, and then did the bust. And that is where I got interested in Austrian economics. Thanks, From Alan Aust Greenspan. Right. <laughs> you know, they, they, they keep creating opportunities for us, you know, much like the inflation we're seeing now is really going to start to push the crypto markets in an interesting way. So uh, left San Francisco in 2001, put all our stuff in storage, packed two backpacks, went backpacking through Southeast Asia, India and Africa uh, for about it ended up being almost three years. We're living on a $15 a day budget. It was really, you know, it was an experience. I really used a lot of that time to learn about Austrian economics, sort of reading up as an immigrant, you know, you, you, I mean, I became a citizen, so obviously I had to pass the test, but really, you know, going a little more in depth into the constitution. And then I'm a little Ron Paulian, you know, I discovered Ron Paul and he was my dude and I liked what he had to say and um, learned about the Free State Project in 2003, got moved out in 2008 and then got really heavily involved. I served as the president from, I think it was uh, 11 to 16, triggered the move, which is the mass exodus of kind of bringing libertarians to the state of New Hampshire. I've run for Senate a few times now. I still chair the FSP. I serve on a lot of boards. I write books. I, you know, I'm just living my best self. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> well, let me ask you, as I know, uh, 
you know, I had you on the audio podcast for kind of a, with a discussing kind of the history of the free state project, but I, I, we don't need to review all of that, but let me just ask you, I guess, real quickly, why of all 50 states in this union, why was New Hampshire chosen as the state to, to, for, to, um, place the free state project in because i know many states were considered even even my home state of maine was considered and yep. sadly uh sadly wasn't the one you guys chose but um why was new hampshire chosen for the free state project so uh there were 101 reasons and now there are probably hundreds more but uh there was a lady who actually made a list of the 101 reasons why new hampshire should be chosen so back in 2003 it was this like 10 state scorecard and people could say, oh, which one? You know, and all the usual suspects were on there. They're mostly smallish states, low population, uh, low taxes, you know, so Wyoming, the Dakotas, Maine, you know, again, all the usual suspects. Uh, New Hampshire, of course, uh, I think ended up winning primarily because there was this push from the locals to say, we want you guys. At the time, the governor was Craig Benson. He was a one-term governor, but he was a very pro-markets guy. And he actually said, you know, we welcome you to the state of New Hampshire, please come. So in 2003, we took the vote, New Hampshire won. Um, I was in New York City at the time and started coming up here. Um, you know, at the time I was like, New Hampshire, where's that? You know, what's that about? And came up and honestly, I've, I've genuinely fallen in love with the state. And don't worry about Maine. When we have our loose Arcadian Federation, we'll, we'll let you guys in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. If it, if it ever comes time for, uh, for divorce from Washington, D.C., it'll be nice to know that we've got some fellow liberty lovers right across the border in New Hampshire, and we can uh, watch each other's backs. Um, but this year has been or this year, this past year, 2021, was a big year for liberty in New Hampshire. I mean, of course, you had the 2020 elections at the end of 2020, where you saw a huge wave of liberty legislators, liberty Republicans in particular, getting elected to your state legislature, flipping the legislature from Democrat to Republican, the only state in the entire country in 2020 where the legislature flipped hands from uh, and this defied all of the predictions of the pundit class who had predicted that Democrats were going to do just fine in New Hampshire. In fact, they were probably going to expand their majorities, and the opposite the opposite happened. I know Young Americans for Liberty. We love to brag and, and take a take a chunk of the credit for that for oh, all yeah. the all the doors that our our liberty loving activists went out there and knocked for some of these Liberty candidates. But um, but of course. You know, you through the Free State Project, you guys have brought in so many people who not just people who are, you know, voting and running for office, but but also people who are helping to promote just a general culture of freedom uh, in the state of New Hampshire. I know that this has really irked some of the uh, maybe <laughs> the southern New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts types. Um, I know I, I, I feel like every other day I see on Twitter the Free State Project kind of retweeting something from the Democrats in New Hampshire complaining about the Free State Project and uh, saying, you guys are giving us the best advertising we could possibly ask for. Um, what has been, um, I guess, tell me a little bit about, I mean, it seems like we're at a tipping point. Uh, for, just from an outsider looking in, it seems that the Free State Project is at a real tipping point uh, uh, right now. What? Uh, tell me a little bit about 2021, uh, some of the victories and, you know, some of the good things that happened this past year. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we all lived through 2021, so <laughs> there was a lot of bleakness, but genuinely for us here, there was, there was a lot of light, you know, as you mentioned, we had a ton of people who got elected uh, and thank you, Yell. I think 63 of, uh, you know, we had 63 of your endorsed candidates who won in New Hampshire. That was 25% of the people uh, Yell endorsed. 74 
people who were endorsed by Rebuild New Hampshire, which was sort of, it started as reopen and became rebuild. 91 from the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance folks got elected. And then 40 people who actually admit or are out as free staters got elected to the House, including the House Majority Leader. So that's kind of how we kicked off the year. The sad news for me personally was I didn't win my Senate race. But honestly, I got 44% against a establishment dude who's in his 80s. Every bad bill that has ever been written in New Hampshire is his fault. The emergency you know, legislation that they used last year and the year before, that was something he wrote. So I'm feeling fairly confident that, you know, this November is maybe going to look a little different. Awesome. Um, so are you yes, going to run again? I think so. I'm going to give it one awesome. more shot and then, and then I'm officially running for president of New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> one more chance. <laughs> Um, but, you know, so over the months, we, we've seen a lot of growth, and you're absolutely right to say this is our moment. Why? Because totalitarianism is good for the liberty business, right? All these people have been awakened, right? The minute you start to have this conversation, and really, we are having a global conversation about self-ownership, about freedom, right? Maybe not everyone is looking at it this way, but, you know, I was in a conference at Mi Mi in Miami last week. And it was just, it was really uplifting to be able to tell people, don't just think about the, the depressing stuff that's happening. Think about the fact that it is actually a, an awakening or a reawakening that we are talking about bodily autonomy. What are your choices? Can the government force you to, you know, do things against your will? No, of course they can. So I think what happened was, uh, people are looking for answers. They're looking for solutions. And we were just early, right? I mean, I moved out in 2008. The idea has been around since 2001. And it just makes sense that we're growing and, you know, expanding and getting more and more people who are interested. I also think there's an element with technology that we should admit. Um, it's gonna be a tipping point because of the censorship we're now seeing, but we are still a little or good enough in the game at the moment to be able to get the message of the Free State Project out. So I think it's, it's exciting because it's a solution driven project, right? It's a project It has the name right there in the name, right? So it's kind of like, what are you gonna come make of it? But it's also for people who are sitting at home and kind of going, something doesn't feel right. Maybe I should be hanging out with my kinds of peeps, you know? And so so I think we're gonna see more of that. I, I believe, and history so far tells us this is the case, you know, at the turn of the 18th, 19th century, there were, I don't know, they're like 70 nation states, I think, and now we have more than 200. So the trend is towards decentralization. And I posit that why can't we as humans go, different people have different desires, we have different values, and we shouldn't all have to be forced to, to come together. And of course, if you're a federalist, you know that the states were supposed to be these laboratories. They were supposed to be able to experiment. And we were supposed to go, wow, what are the good ideas? What are the bad ideas? And let's adopt more of the good and less of the bad. As the federal government grew, and I mean, they're out of control. They're, it's bananas. Like It's just not good. Okay. You know, I think, uh, I think there's this push again back to states' rights. And we're certainly seeing that. I mean, we're seeing it with the discussion about national divorce. We're we're seeing it with, you know, Texit, Nexit, Cal Exit, uh, Brexit even, you know, they went in England, of course, first, that sort of created an opportunity, at least for the discussion. So I think other than in 2008, where we had a really big wave of people who came in, that was my wave, and we kind of called that the first 1000 movers. And that was very much sort of, um, pushed along or, or the impetus was the Ron Paul campaign. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we, we surpassed that now over the last year, we've had literally thousands of people moving. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a bit of a housing crisis. So, you know, we have some work to do on zoning because, uh, you know, we need to be able to build more houses and bring in more people. So it, it's been really exciting. 
Um, if I have to mention like some top things that happened, you know, we're number one in school choice now. We passed an incredibly great school choice bill. Uh, the money follows the child as it is, you know, having served things, you know, can go a little wrong at the state house. So they did put an income requirement on that, which we will work to take out this year. Um, Sometimes you, can't like, get the, sometimes you can't get the whole loaf. So you take half the loaf and then you come back for the other half later. Yeah. And, you know, the, the older and grayer I get, the more I'm like, oh, OK, I do see the value in some incrementalism. Right. You have to take the wins where you can take them and, and, and then try again. And that's an important message because, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. And as we have a lot of young activists who come in, people can easily get discouraged because they're very optimistic. They try something once, it doesn't work. And then they're like, oh, I'm never gonna do anything again. And it's like, no, the point is we do it once it doesn't work. You know, it's the whole moving of the Overton window. So, you know, school choice is done really well. We have an extremely robust um, homeschool, unschool community here a lot. I would say that, Actually, I don't know if I could back this up, but my gut tells me the majority of free staters probably do homeschool. Um, and we have a lot of charter and private schools that are being opened by free staters. I believe there are now three, two are open and one more in the works. So that's a great idea. We have a phenomenal education commissioner, Frank Edelblu. He ran against Chris Sununu um, for governor and lost oh, by close to a thousand votes in the primary. So it was close and, and he got he got Ed because I think Chris didn't want him to run against him again, right? <laughs> and that, um, that's and, one way to get rid of your rivals is put them on your team. <laughs> sure, right? I mean, you know, we should learn from the best. It's a, it's a strong political family. Papa Sununu's got some, you know, magic. <laughs> Um, so, so school choice has just been absolutely huge. That's been exciting. But then also we were the only state that actually cut, cut taxes. We are, we are ending dividends and interest tax. Uh, it's being rolled down in increments, but it's going to go to zero right. so that when we claim and, we are as. And this is income, the last remnant of the income tax. So this is like exactly. the income tax fully abolished in New Hampshire, not, not, you know, it, before New Hampshire advertised, right? No income tax, but you looked into the fine print and it's like, oh, well, I'm getting taxed on this, getting taxed on that. That's gone now. That's huge. Yeah, that is, um, that is huge. And I believe that will help us attract more wealth. Uh, you know, ideally I would love to see New Hampshire. I mean, I would like to see it be a cute little independent country, kind of like Liechtenstein or Luxembourg, like Switzerland was in the, the old days, and have it be a place where, you know, first of all, we would have crypto investment, but we'd also have wealth protection, maybe have people start their companies here and all of that. So we really are moving in that direction. So dividends and interest taxes went down, rooms and meals taxes, which is kind of a big chunk. We're a big tourism state. That is where we get a lot of our money in. And even that has has been reduced. I think it was reduced by half a percentage and it's going to go down a couple of points again. Um, we, we, you know, we now have body cams on all our police that took years and years. And, uh, you know, and that's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart because, you know, I was arrested in 2010 for filming police officers during a late night traffic stop. I got, you know, arrested. They charged me with wiretapping. I ended up, uh, they dropped the charges. Um, and I was like, well, you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> arresting me and now you're gonna pay <laughs> and uh and I sued them 37 counts of violations of my civil rights it took four years went all the way to the first circuit prevailed it is a landmark case it's frequently cited and that wow. case basically says you can film police officers in the execution of their public duties uh don't interfere so like don't jump in the middle and uh they do not 
have qualified immunity. And that is a really big deal on these cases, because we do know that given sort of what we've seen over the past maybe 10 years, really culminating in all the violence and the you know, bad stuff that was happening nationwide with the protests. I'm like, I'm all for the protests, but I'm not for the destruction of private property. So, you know, you got to find that balance between your anger, legitimate anger and a desire for reform and, uh, you know, and lawlessness and just doing what you want. So, um, so we now have all our police officers do wear body cams. That's a pretty big deal. And then another cool thing that happened last year that that I'm also very proud of is I serve on Right to Know New Hampshire. And that is a uh, nonpartisan, you know, just open government advocates, right? Left, right, everyone who's just like, yeah, we'd like to know what you guys are up to with our money. That doesn't seem like, you know, something that is untoward to expect. And um, and we had this list here in New Hampshire, which was called the Lori's List, got rebranded as the Exculpatory Evidence Schedule, the EES. But anyway, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a list of uh, corrupt and questionable police officers. Uh, the list is kept by the DOJ, uh, the New Hampshire DOJ for Brady stuff. So that's just basically like you you have to disclose to the defense attorneys that, oh, there's some issue with this, this particular uh, witness or this particular police officer. Mm-hmm. And so they had kept this list for a long time. And we actually had a judge who in 2019 ruled that man, this list should probably be public. You know what? You guys have a list of bad cops. Maybe uh, people (laughs) should know who those people are. And, you know, they sat on it, fought it, fought it, made personnel excuses, the whole thing. But uh, I think it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So suspiciously, you know, any any news the government doesn't want you to know usually drops right before a big holiday, right? And so they dropped the Lori's list uh, or the EES that night and it came out. And so we now have a public list of officers and people can start to really hold hold their police accountable. I am not one of these people who thinks all police are bad. I am someone who believes in individualism. Uh, But I will tell you, I do think if you rise through the ranks, you're probably getting less good as you go up. And so um, there is work to do on the reform. But that, you know, that was a issue that was near and dear to my heart. So I feel like we are making progress on important issues. Well, you know, there's there's so much, I think, kind of worth unpacking there. I mean, first of all, I, I agree with your sentiments exactly that. Uh, you know, ha- wanting accountability in law enforcement does not necessarily mean you're anti-law enforcement, right? In fact, I want freedom-loving constitutionalist people to serve in these roles. I'd rather have people serve in those roles than uh, than those who don't respect the constitutional rights of the of the people they're supposed to protect and serve. And certainly, uh, having accountability, you know, when there's uh, when there's someone who's abusing their authority in these institutions, that casts a shadow on everyone. I think it's it's good for law enforcement when there's accountability and when people who are abusing their power are uh, are held accountable. It, it 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 allows I think I think it allows the people who are doing their role properly to um uh, to to serve to serve in a you know to serve in a better way without so much uh, uh, suspicion thrown on them for being affiliated with people who are abusing their authority. But I want to get back to something that you said um, uh, earlier on, which was the value of federalism, the value of uh, you know, those of us who believe in federalism understand that the states were supposed to be the laboratories of innovation. And and I and and I just think this is so important and this is our path forward. Now, of course, I think that, you know, in a in a, uh, you know, in a decentralized union like we're supposed to live in, I think it's certainly valuable to have some certain minimum standards and expectations for, you know, people's basic human rights, like, you know, so, as far as, you know, outlawing the enslavement of people and 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 demanding that all states within the union have some certain basic respect for the civil liberties of of the people but that beyond that does that really following from that does that really mean that we're supposed to have one size fits all education programs in America one size fits all healthcare in America why does it seem that 
every single public policy area in uh, in this country is increasingly being dictated in a centralized fashion from Washington, D.C., oftentimes not even by our elected officials in Washington, D.C., but by unelected bureaucratic agencies where power was basically voted to them decades ago and has never been never been revisited or questioned ever since. This isn't how our constitutional republic was supposed to be. The states were supposed to be the laboratories of innovation. And I feel like in America, we are at each other's throats so much these days because we've lost sight of this idea of live and let live. The, the idea that, you know, New Hampshire is different than California. And perhaps the policies that people want in California, maybe they even work for California. But I'll tell you lately, they don't seem to be working for California, despite the fact that people keep voting for them. But but you know what? If California wants to live under policies of tyranny, I suppose that's the business of California. But for the, those in New Hampshire or Maine or Texas or other parts of the country, you know, I feel like we should be able to say, that's fine. You want to do tyranny in your state, you do tyranny over there, but leave us out of it. Let us live free. Let us not have these government busybodies, you know, dictating how we do our school systems, how we do our healthcare systems, how we do. Uh, I mean, even it's, it's crazy to think that even bathroom policies in public schools are now a matter for the Washington, for the federal government in Washington, DC. I mean, how, how did we get to this point where our federal government is so intimately involved with everything that even even down to bathroom policies in our in our local community schools has to be decided by uh, uh, by these folks in, in the city hundreds of miles away? It, it, it's amazing. And so I, I love what you guys are doing there. Um in terms of fighting back against, I know there's been so much COVID tyranny to fight back. You guys have been fighting back against the, that there. But but I'm really convinced that it's going to take states standing up, and New Hampshire is really leading the way in this regard. States standing up, invoking the principles of Jefferson and Madison, uh, You know the, the right and the responsibility of states to nullify unconstitutional federal laws, whether they be unconstitutional mandates and edicts from the president of the United States or unconstitutional, you know, uh, uh, laws passed by the Congress. It's going to be it's going to require the states to stand up and say, you know what, we're not going along with your gun control, you know, uh, 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 policies. You know, that's that's not your authority. You know, you're you're uh, uh, these are null and void within our state borders. 